So yeah, if something's chopped off, you're going to have to tell me because um, every once in a while the projector and the laptop kind of get don't have the right aspect or ratio. So it'll eventually figure itself out. But this is not the first time this has happened. But I like, on purpose, each of my units, I don't know if you've noticed, but each of my units kind of pick up with the previous topic and bring it into the new unit. So that's, again, what I've done. And um, with regard to stars, we talked about how stars are born, how stars do the whole main sequence thing, and they kind of move around on the HR diagram. And now we want to focus on the deaths of stars. So you guys don't have this slide, but if you kind of recognize what these pairs of figures are, they are in the top talking about, um, let me change the color of my marker. In the top, these are talking about low mass stars. Okay. And we said that if you were to kind of talk about the end of the life of a low mass star, of course that's planetary nebula, and I'll put WD for white dwarf. And high mass stars, okay, over here, this is the supernova. I'll put SN for supernova. And this, you told me on your test, that little remnant that's left over can either be a neutron star or a BH, stands for black hole. So when we talk about the, the deaths of stars, that's kind of what we're focusing on. But there's more to it, obviously, otherwise there wouldn't be a whole chapter on the deaths of stars. In this chapter, I know some of you um, kind of took this class because because I read early on for the early on quiz that you are interested in black holes. So I'll do my best at explaining that kind of strange sort of thing. So white dwarfs, right? I always think of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Nothing to do with Snow White. But white dwarfs are basically, we said a low mass star cannot do any more nuclear fusion. And so basically it's a chunk of carbon that's going to just kind of cool down. It moves on the HR diagram kind of underneath the main sequence. It, it did its planetary nebula thing. Okay. Um, so the thing about white dwarves, and I'm, I think I'm going to start uh, Wednesday's lecture kind of showing you a little more of that video that we watched. But the thing about white dwarves we saw in the video is the star, okay, it's, a, it's, a st it's, it's done the whole star thing for like 10 billion years or so. Okay. So basically over that amount of time, and this is going to, hopefully this will make sense when we start to talk about kind of density. But the white dwarf is very dense. Okay? Gravity is like, it's just really dense. So if you were to visit a white dwarf to take a teaspoon of material, it would weigh like, like tons. A teaspoon of material, it would like weigh tons. Why? Because gravity made it very dense. Okay. Um, so, but the thing about a white dwarf is... Like this says, it talks about electron degeneracy. You're like, what electron degeneracy? Well, you know what electrons are, right? They're the outermost particle around the atom. Electron degeneracy just simply says atom A and atom B that has electrons outside of it. Electron degeneracy says, we are not going to squish this anymore because electrons from A and electrons from B are saying no more. That's electron degeneracy. And a white dwarf is supported by electron degeneracy. So a pair of stars, actually, we're going to talk about binary stars, because remember eclipsing binaries, you can't tell they're two by visual methods, but you can actually tell they're two by eclipsing. Well, here's a pair of stars that actually you can tell that there are two stars. Okay, we have Sirius B, seriously, and Sirius A. Sirius A, like this says, is a main sequence star, and what I'm hoping is that out there in the real world in a year or two years or so, when someone says, that's a main sequence star, you'd be like, I know what that is. Okay. So it's a bright main sequence star. The star Sirius is the dog star in Canis Major, the big dog, which is Orion, the hunter, psychic. Okay. So actually in the morning now you can see Orion and you can see the constellation um, Canis Major and a really bright star is Sirius. Seriously. But the cool thing about this 
is if we look at the same pair of stars, okay, Sirius A, main sequence, Sirius B, white dwarf. If we switch wavelengths that we look at these, okay, notice that with regard to brightness, they kind of switch. This is the retired star, okay, and that's Sirius A, main sequence star. All we've done is just simply, instead of catching visible light, now we're catching light in higher energies. <coughs> it just means that it's, it's complicated. It just means that as they age, the types of energy they emit is also different. Okay. So this probably looks familiar, kind of the, <coughs> as a star lives its life, uh, just a single star, starts out on the main sequence, and this is kind of showing you uh, a, a star the size of our sun is going to ultimately end up as a white dwarf and kind of shows you that pattern again. So white dwarfs. White dwarfs are very compact. Side by side, you see the Earth, a planet, and you see a white dwarf candidate. They're the same volume, but check it out. Instead of weighing the size of the Earth, this weighs the size of the sun. You're like, dang, okay? One solar mass, <sighs> size, volume of the Earth. There's another cool thing about white dwarfs. It's, there's a lot of goes against intuition, counterintuitive stuff in astronomy. Notice now, instead of a white dwarf that's one solar mass, we have a white dwarf that's 1.3 solar masses. And instead of getting larger, it gets smaller. So basically, you know, I'll go over here and I'll kind of stomp on it. Going from 1 to 1 1.3, stomp, 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 smaller volume. Kind of weird. Denser? Yes. <laughs> I think that that video says um, you would be squashed if you tried to stand on the surface of a white dwarf. This would not be a good idea. Okay. But even squashing, there's a limit. Everything has its limits. Is that black holes? Okay, so the limit for a white dwarf, basically, is you can go one solar mass. You can go 1.3 solar masses. But the problem is, like the slide says, is you squish that thing down. Um, the laws of physics require that the electrons, as you squish it down, go faster and faster. I'm okay with that, I guess. Go faster and faster. Electrons go faster and faster. At about 1.4 solar masses is your white dwarf. The electrons are going so fast, they're approaching the speed of light. And one of the things that we actually learn in this chapter is objects cannot exceed, including electrons, nothing can go faster than the speed of light. Okay, it's problematic. So basically, that's 1.4 solar masses is the limit of a white dwarf. They call it the Chandra Sekar limit. And I totally butch that name. It's Indian. But, okay. So... 1.4 solar masses. Remember it because we're going to kind of come back to it. So we said that two-thirds or maybe even more than that of the stars that you see in the sky and the stars that you don't see in the sky actually, and this kind of makes sense because they were oftentimes born in the stellar nursery, they are gravitationally hanging out. They're binary stars. Okay. Well, one of the things that can happen, and <coughs> here's my little warning, this may or may not be an altered slide. When I say altered slide, in this case, it's kind of the figures are turned around. Let me know if something's chopped off. Okay. So it's a little bit off the screen, okay. but consider um, a white dwarf and a, um, uh, a lower mass star. White dwarf is retired, lower mass star is not retired. Okay, one of the things we said as that, um, well, I don't say lower mass, but yeah, I guess as that lower mass star evolves, like we said on the test, its core, when it runs out of hydrogen to fuse into helium, its core is going to contract and its outside is going to expand. Of course, we call that a giant, right? And in its giant stage, it's so swollen, and actually there's a mathematical region, we know where that sweet spot is, that actually it's so swollen, it can transfer material onto its retired white dwarf. So that's kind of the scenario I want to talk about um, for the next few minutes. So just to kind of, I'll put WD for white dwarf, and I'll put giant here. Okay, so we have material. And 
I bet you'll buy this. Actually, the material on the outside of that giant star is hydrogen. So basically, oops, sorry, fresh hydrogen. Okay, so when we were going over your test a minute ago and I talked about white dwarfs, they aren't always retired. This is the case where they kind of come out of retirement. Um, and I think I made that up. I mean, I didn't make up the concept, but the phrase coming out of retirement. Now, I'm going to warn you. There's two ways a white dwarf can come out of retirement. I'm going to go ahead and put them over here. We're going to talk about them in this order. Okay, it can come out of retirement one of two ways. I'll put first an event we call, oops, N-O-V-A, NOVA. That's the singular. Okay, a NOVA, not the TV show. Okay, that one event is when it comes out of retirement. The other event is much more drastic and actually... Don't blame me because it's a term we've talked about before, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it up here again, a supernova. And I'm going to add to it type 1, Roman numeral A. Okay. White dwarf comes out of retirement. Why? It's got a companion dumping stuff on it. Why is the companion dumping stuff on it? Because it's a giant. It happens. Okay, these are the two things, two events that can happen. But part of your task... Um, in this chapter is kind of to kind of sort that out. What's the difference between a nova or a supernova type 1A? There's a big difference. Okay. So here we go. Um, this would be your giant. And in the middle there, amidst the kind of what we call accretion disk, is your retired white dwarf. Okay, so this is your... Let me go back. This is your white dwarf. So here's the deal. This is your fresh hydrogen. Now, we're going to talk in this chapter about a thumping called thumping, something called an accretion disk. An accretion disk can really kind of be thought of as, um, it's pretty good, if you pull the plug in your bathtub and you're letting your bathtub water drain down the drain. I guess it's near the end, maybe, of your water. You know, your bathtub water's drained down. But don't you kind of see the swirl, 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 and kind of the vortex going down into, okay. This, that concept is an accretion disk. Okay. Not your all, all your bath water, but kind of that circular circle of material. So just kind of like your bathtub draining, it goes faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. So honestly, in this accretion disk, coming from fresh hydrogen, coming from your bloated giant, we can, like this slide says, or it's on the next slide, we can get um, temperatures sufficient for, guess what, nuclear fusion. I know it's weird because, like, fusion can only occur in the course of stars, okay, or Homer Simpson sort of thing, <coughs> you know, on Earth, okay. Um, so that fusion... There's no bounds on it, so basically that fusion kind of goes, and it basically kind of blows the accretion disk out of the water. It leaves the white dwarf intact. Okay. So that's what a nova event is. I said there's two possible things that a white dwarf can do. One of them is a nova. Okay. So as so we look at kind of this to this, okay, this is the scenario before the nova. This is the scenario at the time of the nova. Why do they occur? They basically occur because that material that's in Q coming from fresh hydrogen from that giant okay, heated up okay, and it blew. It leaves the white dwarf totally intact. Okay. So that's a nova. So that kind of okay. What happens is where it's dark, basically, where we don't have much energy coming from a region, we have a significant amount of energy coming all at one time. And like kind of some other events we've seen, supernovas cool down, novas cool down. Okay, so over time, that bright light is going to go away. So nova. Before I go on to supernova, let me 
and I'm sure it was on a slide, but I'm going to go ahead and maybe it's on a slide coming up. Um, do you see where these can can reoccur? And I'll go ahead and say why, because the WD, white dwarf, is in intact. Is that two words? Hmm. One word. The white dwarf's intact, and the giant's still a giant. Okay, so nova events can reoccur. I don't think you'd see two nova events in your given lifetime. That it's funny how stars are like, eh, what's 100,000 years here, you know? So that's kind of what we have. Okay, so I have some slides now to talk about supernova. It's funny because if you talk to a little kid about a supernova event, they might say, ooh, 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 that's a star blowing up. It's like, yeah, it is. And for whatever reason, astronomers have chosen that term, supernova, to describe, I think, two different events. Okay, so we talked in the last unit of material, if a star is eight solar masses or larger, okay, it's going to blow up, okay? It just, it's going to eventually end up with iron in its core and it can't fuse that, so it's going to blow up and leave a neutron star or black hole. We call that a type two supernova, okay? Type two, Roman numeral two. Right. All right. Now, there's the 1A supernova. Roman numeral one, letter A, lowercase a. That actually is the exact situation we were talking about. White dwarf, close binary. I'll go ahead and say close binary with a bloated red star or with giant. So it's, it's kind of specific conditions. Okay, retired star. Red giant, okay? And basically, it's been dumped on, dumped on, dot, 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 so that, oh, that says dumped, dumped on. Well, oh, anyway. It gets dumped on so that actually the white dwarf um, approaches that 1.4 solar masses, that Chandrasekhar limit, okay? And ultimately, it blows up. That white dwarf blows up. It sounds kind of anticlimactic. <coughs> but it does. So the thing about this type of uh, event that has a retired white dwarf star and a red giant, this cannot reoccur. Why? Because the white dwarf blew up. So I'm going to say cannot reoccur. Cannot reoccur, even if it wanted to. Sad face. <coughs> so I don't know. Scientists, crazy as they are, look for kind of, they use all the tools available and try to kind of differentiate between this type 2 supernova event, which most people think of when they think of supernova, and this 1A supernova. What they have in common is they're very bright events. But if you look closely, what you're looking at is kind of the dimming process. So kind of along the x-axis is basically time, okay? And along the y-axis is brightness. And so basically they're saying there's a subtle difference in how they dim over time. I don't know. I couldn't pick that up. But if you were in the business, you'd say, I can characterize one as a massive star that blew up. That's the blue one. And without the bump, um, kind of a different type of decay process would be that white dwarf that blew up. Okay. So this is looking at their light curves. So supernova, there's, there's two types of supernova. So kind of on your next exam, I'll try to kind of make sure we're all on the same page with that. The other thing, it's a little frustrating, is the white dwarf can do two things. And they kind of both have the same scenario where you have the white dwarf and the giant. And so to kind of distinguish between whether it's a nova or a supernova type 1A, OK, 
okay? One is that the supernova uh, 1A, where basically the white dwarf got dumped on and it exceeds the 1.4 solar masses and it blows up, it's brighter, okay? It's brighter than the nova event by a lot, <laughs> okay? And you notice here, and I actually kind of made sure I wrote it on the slide, but when we talked about nova events, nova events can reoccur. Okay, it's kind of like that accretion disk blows up. It's kind of like the blanket kind of, I don't know, I guess it's not a blanket, it's more like a skirt around the white dwarf blows up. Okay. So this last one doesn't really differentiate between the nova and the supernova, but it kind of talks about um, the difference between the type 1A and the type 2 supernova. I bet this makes sense. If the white dwarf blows up, okay, supernova type 1A, um, it's not going to leave a neutron star or a black hole. Okay, so to kind of summarize, you know, how do you know which type of supernova you have? They're both similar brightnesses. We said that you can look at their light curves, how they diminish over time. You can kind of see a subtle difference. The other thing is that you can actually look at what sort of elements are involved. So that's where I wanted to get to today. And so um, what we're going to start off on Wednesday is a little, it's like a minute and a half of that video we were watching to kind of remind you, what is a neutron star? We're going to talk about neutron stars, black holes, and kind of the physics of black holes. So yeah, uh, that will be for Wednesday. So that's all I have today. <laughs>